Hey everybody, welcome back to Reason and Theology. I want to review some comments that Father James Altman has recently made in multiple videos about Pope Francis so that we can kind of get a fix on what he thinks about Pope Francis. I have done one video so far on some of his comments, but we're seeing some additional developments here that I think should certainly be considered whenever we are discussing his view of Pope Francis, the Catholic Church. And, you know, unfortunately, I'm not hearing enough discussion about these things, so I want to put it right out there in the forefront and review some of this stuff. These are some clips that were sent to me um, that I certainly thought were worth noting. I'm going to share my screen here, and we're going to take a look at a few of them. Let's go to this one right here. Let's start with this one. This one is called... Live Rosary with Father James Altman, uh, streamed two weeks ago. So this is... I recollect it had something to do with... Very recent. Let me make sure that the audio is enabled before I begin. Uh, here we go. Okay, you should be able to see it now. Let's go ahead and dive in and see what he says here. He's really the last pope and, and Bergoglio is a bad guy. Well, we already know this, that Bergoglio is a bad guy. He's an apostate. He's not Catholic. So Bergoglio, instead of calling him uh, Pope Francis, he decides to call him Bergoglio. He says he's an apostate. An apostate means somebody who has completely repudiated the Christian faith. So maybe somebody who is, uh, you know, at one point a Christian, but they completely renounce Christianity altogether and they become an atheist or they become a Muslim. You know, that's that's apostasy. Apostasy is not necessarily heresy. Heresy is a denial of a dogma. You could be a heretic without being an apostate. Uh, but apostasy is, again, full-blown. You have renounced Christianity altogether. He says he is an apostate. He's not Catholic. So he is not, um, uh, at least to one degree or another, in communion with the Catholic Church because it's kind of essential to be a Catholic in order to be in full communion with the Catholic Church. You know this. He prances around in that white cassock. Prances around in a white cassock. I don't know if he's suggesting that perhaps he's just um, not the Pope and he's just dressing as one, or if he's saying, well, he is the Pope, but he's not taking it seriously in his white cassock. Not sure leading lambs astray in a way I, I myself could not even begin to imagine. Um, simply not Catholic. The very fact that he said, I'm a communist because Jesus was a communist in the gospel is, is. Yeah. And so what's interesting here is individuals like this who criticize Pope Francis, they never give them the benefit of the doubt and rarely will actually go and look in context and see what they're saying and what they mean by what they're saying. That's a whole video in and of itself, but nothing new there as far as taking Pope Francis right out of context, running with it. Now, of course, if you were to do that with individuals like this, like maybe Father Altman, they certainly wouldn't appreciate that. I've noticed when people take them out of context, they get very defensive. But I see them failing to do that with others, failing to be patient, try to be understanding giving the best interpretation. It's unfortunate. The last 10 Catholic popes have said the exact opposite expressly. So that Bergoglio would even dare to say something like that is just mind blowing. And that people don't recognize it. And the bishops don't stand up and say, sorry, just tells you 96% of the, the church hierarchy in Jesus' day crucified him. What is 96% of the church hierarchy in our day doing? They're crucifying him all over again. I'm not surprised. My, I'm not ninety six percent of the bishops, from what we just heard, are crucifying Jesus. It's an interesting take. Not disappointed. My expectation would be it would be the same amount, and uh, I'm only affirmed every time Bergoglio opens his mouth. I'm only affirmed in in the anti catholic catholicity of his office. So, um. Yeah, so pay no pay no attention to these people that just crop up out of nowhere, uh, claiming whatever. But I, but I heard, and I could be wrong, 
my last recollection of what I heard was that was one great big hoax. That they're asking him about Garibaldi, which what is the deal? What is the deal? Why are we whoring around after fake apparitions and private revelation like the Israelites hoard after the Baals over and over and over? It's like, what are we doing? Now, obviously, I recognize utility to private revelation. Obviously, I do. I'm Catholic. It's clearly affirmed by the Catholic Church that there's utility to private revelation. I understand all that. I affirm that. But I affirm it in the proper perspective. Keep things in perspective. Focus on divine revelation revealed in sacred scripture primarily. These other things are auxiliary. But what I'm saying is people who don't even know the Bible chasing around every single thing they can get their hands around. Just chasing after it like harlots and ready to give themselves over to just anything. As my recent videos uh, prove, where I discuss the fake Benedict apparition, and I also discuss the issue of our messenger of Monroe. If you don't know what I'm talking about, type maybe those in on YouTube, and you'll find out very quickly. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what they're talking about there is Garibaldi, which the Vatican um, has told people to um, avoid and not promote. Okay, so let's move on to this next video. This is one that is posted on life site news let's watch a few minutes of this clip and see what he says here every single bishop in this country should have said that jorge bergoglio should have said that but what did jorge bergoglio do that viper that antichrist said viper and antichrist i know that jesus used um i'm sorry john the baptist used the term viper <clears throat> for some of the Pharisees, and it's certainly legitimate when he did so, but I do question one's use of such terms if they're not John the Baptist, given the fact that later on in the book of Acts in the New Testament, Paul himself dared not to speak against the high priest because he said you should not speak evil against the ruler of your people, quoting from the Old Testament. So if Paul felt that he wasn't worthy enough to speak against a whitewashed tomb, uh, I kind of wonder if we should be doing that. But an antichrist, that's that's an interesting term uh, to call the Pope. I, I seem to recall some Protestants who say the same thing. I'm pretty sure Martin Luther, among some of the other reformers, believed that the pope was the antichrist lefebvre called uh the pope such things he said that um the antichrist is sitting in the sea of saint peter as i showed in previous videos very interesting concepts that we're hearing from altman here let's listen to it again sitting and prancing around a white robe he mandated it in there it goes the comment again prancing around in a white robe they are the ones who should have said your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you do not become anyone's guinea pig. Every single bishop in this country should have said that. Jorge Bergoglio should have said that. But what did Jorge Bergoglio do? That viper, that antichrist, sitting and prancing around a white robe. He mandated it inside Vatican City that you had to get the jab. Really, really great work. Please pass on to Steve and Naomi, who I know you know, uh, our thanks and congratulations amazing work to undergo that much to it's hard it's a hard slog all right so you get the gist with that one let's move on to another one here uh another one with life site news this one posted on rumble or at least it's got john henry west in there uh looks like it's called faith and reason um on rumble let's hear what he has to say here because he knew what was going to happen. And there it is. And what that says to us here, sitting here today, is that the resignation by Benedict itself was not particularly valid because he was under such pressure as. Huh. We're going to, I'm going to play this out, you know, so you can hear more. But notice that. Notice that. I'm going to play it, play it again and continue to play it out. But notice what we just heard. The resignation of Pope Benedict wasn't particularly valid. Which would mean what? That Benedict was still Pope. 
And if Benedict was still Pope, that would mean Francis isn't Pope. Hmm. If Francis isn't Pope, Benedict is dead. I guess the sea is vacant. Now, he doesn't say any of this. But I'm just trying to think of how this works out when you kind of take it to its conclusion. Let's hear that again. An awareness of the wolves in sheep's clothing all around him that he knew he had to put this in there. He could, this is, this isn't, this is prophetic, but, but maybe it's just, uh, instead of mere saying it's prophetic, because then that suggests that he, by the way, this four months ago is when this was posted, had no awareness of what was going on. He put those in there on purpose because he knew what was going to happen. And there it is. And what that says to us here, sitting here today, is that the resignation by Benedict itself was not particularly valid because he was under such pressure, as we've discussed earlier, but also that because of the electioneering and everything, that the, the election of Pope Francis, Jorge Bergoglio, was invalid. Like it never, never had effect no matter what. Isn't it? This is profound. Let's hear that one more time. Let's start a little earlier. John Henry, and, and can, so having brought that up, doesn't it strike you as unusual that for the first time in the history of the Catholic Church, a, a glorious Pope seen by more human beings in real life than anyone else in, in history, just not that long before he himself is getting sick and dying, puts into our church those rules about resignation and about election and the, the invalidity of an election. Um, what we have being referenced here is John Paul II's University Dominici Gregis, um, which, by the way, there's nothing in here that would say that um, Francis's election was invalid. And canonist Ed Peters... Um, would would certainly bear that out. So it's not just my particular take on it. What they'll do is they'll go to um, a select portion uh, of this document where it talks about how there's an automatic excommunication for cardinals who are conspiring to elect the person. And yes, that's true. There is an automatic excommunication for them, but they still um, validly vote. Ex automatically excommunicated cardinals still validly vote in a conclave. Um, maybe that shouldn't be the case, but for better or worse, it is the case. A, a cardinal who is automatically excommunicated still validly votes, but illicitly votes. So their actions are illicit in the conclave, but it's still valid, meaning that Pope Francis's election would still be valid, even if Pope Francis himself as a cardinal was somehow automatically excommunicated. That still doesn't pertain to the validity of his election. And of course, it would be lifted um, at his first confession, if not by the elevation itself. But uh, but that's a whole different discussion. But as far as validity, yes, it's it's certainly still there. But what they'll do is they'll point that out, and then they'll um, point to a completely different part of this document, and they'll say, see, John Paul II is now talking about the invalidity of the entire conclave. But if you look at the context, what he's talking about when it comes to the invalidity of the context is not the illicit actions of cardinals who are conspiring, but rather illicit actions that are taking place during the conclave itself, not prior to the conclave. And they completely miss that. They just rip it right out of context, which I know I've addressed this before on the show, but I thought I'd mention it just in case somebody else isn't familiar. So this is a common error that some people who are set of a contest are promoting um, or people who were been of a contest, but now uh, perhaps are a set of a contest, depending on who we're talking about. Uh, this is a common argument that they've used, but it's a very, very basic and simplistic mistake that again, if you just simply look at the context, the context bears that out. And again, it's not just my interpretation. See Ed Peters. 
uh, who has written extensively on this very issue. Um, so this does not serve their purposes. But for somebody who isn't very well trained in theology, for someone who doesn't really know canon law, that's going to sound it's going to sound really convincing to appeal to this document. They're going to be like, yeah, well, there you go. There was a conspiracy to elect Pope Francis, the 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 saying um, or the theory goes, which is, again, a whole different thing. But let's just go ahead and accept it gratuitously here. Uh, you know, hypothetically, if there's a conspiracy, they'll say, well, see, that means the whole thing is invalid. And no, that's actually not what the document indicates. It does indicate that it's illicit. It does indicate that these individuals are automatically excommunicated, but they still have um, the ability to function in the church in their office because a person like a bishop, for instance, who's automatically excommunicated or um, a bishop who uh, perhaps is in mortal sin or something like that. And uh, there's there's a cutting off, if you will, from the interior virtues of faith, hope and charity like they still are able to govern in the church unless the Pope relieves them from ministry. Um, so same thing happens here. An excommunicated cardinal who's like automatically excommunicated for better or worse can still validly vote, but he's not acting illicitly. All right, let's continue. What? I mean, if I, let's pretend I was Pope for a second. That, that I've got a lot of things to think about, and that would not be one of them. And yet Pope St. John Paul II had it so much on his mind an awareness of what was going on around him, an awareness of the wolves in sheep's clothing all around him, that he knew. Did he say Pope St. John Paul II? Who was it who elevated uh, John Paul II? Let's see here. Mm hmm. -hmm. Let's see who elevated him to sainthood. Let me uh, see if I can uh, show you here on the screen. There you go. Vatican declares Popes John Paul II and John the 23rd th Saints, April 2014. Who was Pope at that time? Pope Francis has declared Pope John Paul II a saint. That's interesting. In light of the context of this discussion, um, it's interesting that we called John Paul II a saint there when he was elevated by Pope Francis in the context of this discussion. Okay. He had to put this in there. He could, this is, this isn't, this is prophetic, mm -hmm. but, but maybe it's just, uh, instead of mere saying it's prophetic, because then that suggests that he had no awareness of what was going on. He put those in there on purpose because he knew what was going to happen. And there it is. And what that says to us here, sitting here today, is that the resignation by Benedict itself was not particularly valid because he was under such pressure as we've discussed earlier, but also that because of the electioneering and everything, that the, the election of Pope Francis, Jorge Bergoglio, was invalid. Like it never, never had effect no matter what. Isn't it? This is profound. Well, I have a question for you, and you might know the answer to this. So if, let's, for argument's sake, say that Pope Francis weren't properly elected or Benedict didn't properly resign, so all of that would mean the same thing. All of the sainthoods, all of the making of cardinals, all those things would... The sainthood, like John Paul II, being a saint. What not exist now? Those those cardinals are not cardinals. Those saints are not saints. Or is there some provision of the church that takes care of that? Sure. So you know, I think it's the Donatists. I always thought also the Jansenists that said the effect of the sacrament mm -hmm. does not depend upon the holiness mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the person celebrating the sacrament. However. That's, that's entirely different, and this is a brilliant question, John Henry, that's entirely different from the fact that there must be a valid ordination, for instance, to, to affect it. 
uh, such that that's why when when some of these baptisms were invalid, it caused them to question every sacrament. May I'm sorry, I thought we were talking about the context of um, papal elections, appointments to um, uh, the College of Cardinals, and also saints, canonization. I thought we were talking in that context. I did not know we were talking in the context of, of sacramental validity of holy orders. I, I feel like, did I miss something? How did we go from the question had to do with validity of appointments to the college of cardinals and the validity of a papal election and we somehow all of a sudden out of nowhere i'm not sure how unless i missed it we shifted to a question of validity of episcopal ordinations all right made by or attempted by someone who was not properly baptized wherefore the ordination didn't count therefore the seeming sacraments he uh, did don't don't count. Uh, so if the Pope Bergoglio was not properly Pope, would those things with regard to wait 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 hold hold on? We went from a discussion of the validity of a papal election to sacramental validity of one's ordination back to a discussion of validity of one's elevation to the papacy. Those are not in the same category. Those are separate discussions. I'm completely confused why we're speaking of these things in a conflated way as if they're in the same category, but I don't know. Maybe there's some clarification here. Let's see. To uh, elevating people to Cardinals. That's, that's just a little whim and caprice on the part of him. Uh, I guess he could have his own little set of advisors all around him that wear the red hat, but they're imposters. They're posing as something that they are not because Bergoglio wasn't really the Pope uh, because of because of these things instituted by John Paul II because he could see what was coming down the road. The sacraments, of course, that he would have celebrated, assuming his original ordination was valid, would, would also still be valid, but... Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. But this is key when it comes to who's going to be then valid as a cardinal to elect the next pope at the next conclave. What an unbelievable situation would be. Um, you know what that reminds me? I want to listen to that again, and, and we'll play this further. But the answer that I got there, here, here's what that reminded me of. Hold on. Okay. Here we go. Recent polls. This this is what that reminded me of. Honestly, I'm not I'm not joking. I'm not trying to be mean. This is honestly what I feel we just heard as far as a response. Okay. Recent polls have shown a fifth of Americans can't locate the US on a world map. Why do you think this is? I personally believe that US Americans are unable to do so. Because uh, some uh, people out there in our nation don't have maps, and uh, I believe that our ed education, like such as in South Africa and uh, the Iraq, everywhere like such as, and I believe that they should, uh, our education over here in the U.S. should help the U.S. Or, or should help South Africa and should help the Iraq and the Asian countries, so we will be able to build up our future for our now i totally get what happened there she's nervous i've i've given answers like that if i'm nervous too like i totally get that i kind of feel like that is what i got here as far as a response from father altman i'm not exactly sure how any of that was coherent but it could be a problem with me and my own comprehension uh, so it could be an issue with my own comprehension skills, but I'm not exactly sure how that was a clear answer. But I don't, I don't know. Let's see if there's some further clarification. And perhaps these cardinals then aren't cardinals. They can't vote in the next election. However, could you come to another papacy if, if this were true? You'll notice he did not answer whether or not Pope Francis is actually the Pope. I mean, we got a whole lot of hints there, but we did not get an explicit, like, here's what I believe kind of thing. I mean, I guess this is part of the 
big question for those who would consider themselves sedificantists or those who consider themselves beneficantists, like the, that Benedict was still Pope. Um, and then those who wonder even what happens with uh, Francis being removed of his own accord by heresy. So it gets bizarrely complicated and no one knows anymore what to do. God's the one who's going to sort this one out. Yeah, he's going to have to. If Benedict's resignation wasn't valid, uh, remember there was. there's always been this argument, and I'm not wise or knowledgeable enough to, to argue either side of it. Well, um, I think we heard a whole lot of arguments for one particular side. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how that's a sincere answer. That he resigned the administrative aspect of it, but not, I think it's called the moonness, the actual, mm -hmm. maybe that's the administrative part, but the part that, uh, you know, as a priest, I have a bunch of people doing the administrative stuff in the parish, so I can be the sacramental minister I'm supposed to be. It seems that Benedict never resigned that aspect of the papacy, but the entire aspect of the papacy would not have been resigned if, in fact, he was put under undue pressure by these outside sources like the like the American intelligence agencies. And, you know, speaking about feeling like an orphan again, we're or he's not answering the question directly, um, which I find interesting because generally this crowd criticizes Pope Francis for being ambiguous and they'll criticize Vatican II for being ambiguous. And yet they are one of the most ambiguous groups out there. In 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 Christianity as a whole, it's hard to get direct responses and answers from this group. That was still relatively ambiguous. He was quite clear in saying that, you know, it seems like Benedict's resignation was invalid and thus Pope Francis's election was invalid. But then when he's put forward with the question, well, does that mean Pope Francis isn't the Pope? Does that mean these appointments to the College of Cardinals are invalid and therefore the next election is going to be invalid? You're not going to get a direct response or a direct answer. Orphan, because we don't really have a Pope. There is a de facto schism in the Catholic Church. We've known this now for years. A de facto schism. Uh, so, and it's, it's not us that are doing the schisming. It's these people, these globalists, the Bergoglios and all his followers that have schismed away from the deposit of faith. And that's crystal clear. This is exactly what Martin Luther would have argued. This is what the Orthodox argue, the Eastern Orthodox. This is like every heretic and schismatic in church history would have argued. They would have said, I'm not the one in schism. You're the one in schism. I'm not the heretic. You're in heresy. Clear. In one sense, John Henry, it is very complex. Like, how do you sort this out? And Liz, you're right. Well, God's going to be the one to sort it out. Except it is actually very simple. Maybe at this point, with the death of Benedict, maybe there isn't a pope. There's someone posing as a pope. He says maybe. Like, he's, he's not giving a direct answer. Like, do you believe... It's a maybe. It's a maybe. It's interesting. Um, you know, if somebody were to go around and say, well, maybe Father Altman is a woman. I'm not saying he is a woman. But maybe he is a woman. And maybe he's really not of the male gender. I'm not saying that he isn't of the male gender, but maybe he isn't. And you know, give all kinds of like circumstantial evidence that somehow, and by the way, I, I do believe that Father Altman is a male. Like, I'm just throwing this out as an analogy. I don't really believe this. He's clearly a male. Uh, but if somebody were to come along on YouTube and be like, and they're sincerely arguing, like, you know, there's this thing that Altman said, and then he he walked a certain way, and he crossed his legs at one meeting in this particular way. And so, you know, I'm not saying he's a woman, but, you know, maybe he is. a He would be incredibly offended. He would say this is ridiculous. He would, you know, but it's like these guys feel it's appropriate for them to do the same with Pope Francis. But neither was because upon Benedict's death, if his if his resignation was not particularly valid because of these reasons, 
like now there actually is a vacancy, mm-hmm. not because of a set of accountants kind of a uh, off on that direction, uh, but because in the natural order of things, which is called set of accountism, by the way. I mean, he said not in a set of accountants. Way. Have you noticed that there are some people out there who say the sea is vacant and they they decry being called set of accountants, but they will explicitly say the words the sea is vacant. <laughs> it's like, do you know what set of a contest of means? Like what the actual word means? It means the sea is vacant. It, you're literally defining yourself as a set of a contest when you say the sea is vacant. That's the very definition of set of a contest. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's so ridiculous. It's like somebody who, you know, a mother who just gave birth to a child, but he says, do not call me a mother. Like, it's, impossible i am not a mother in any kind of way and they literally just gave birth to a human you know (laughs) it's the definition of motherhood like how do you deny these terms well the reason why they deny it is because they know that there's a lot of crazy association with the term set of contests so they don't like it even though the person who says the sea is vacant is a set of a contest by definition some of them will decry that term because they know it's associated with a group of people that they themselves have long fought against. Uh, okay. Had he never resigned at this point, point upon his death, there would be an opening that is not yet filled. The argument- if, right? If, like if it wasn't valid. Yeah, if. But then the question was asked, well, is this in fact the case? And we didn't really get a direct answer here. I mean, is that there still is an opening that's not yet filled, but also because of these other things with regard to University Dominici Gregis, which is the document that I just discussed here, which I'll put a link to in the show notes where I go through this in detail and I show that they engage in very elementary blunders with the document. And you don't have to be an expert in the magisterium to see that. It's it's pretty basic, really. Um, okay. That Pope St. John Paul II actually saw forthcoming, which is why he put that in there. Who do we have? Who do we look to? We're orphans. You know, John Henry, this was a one-two punch of the globalists to, um, to knock out the Catholic Church, get rid of Ratzinger, install Bergoglio. Um, there are a number of people out there right now who know what happened. And if the bishops and cardinals are not going to speak out about it, um, then it's up to the lady to um, demand that these questions be answered. You don't have the SWIFT system knock out the entire financial ATMs, uh, Vatican um, financial system shortly before he um, resigns, uh, Ratzinger resigns, and then is reintegrated and up and running right after he resigns. Therefore, all of the wild conspiracies that have followed from that phenomenon are valid and true. Completely logically follows. I want to hear that one beginning part one more, one more time before we move on to the next clip. Just not that long before he himself is getting sick and dying puts into our church those rules about resignation and about election and the, the invalidity of an election. What I mean, if I, let's pretend I was Pope for a second, that that I've got a lot of things to think about, and that would not be one of them. And yet Pope St. John Paul II had it so much on his mind an awareness of what was going on around him, an awareness of the wolves in sheep's clothing all around him, that he knew he had to put this in there. He could, this is, this isn't, this is prophetic, but, but maybe it's just, uh, instead of mere saying it's prophetic, because even if all this is true and it's prophetic, it still doesn't mean the conclave or the resignation were both invalid. That still doesn't logically fall. Then, that suggests that he had no awareness of what was going on. He put those in there on purpose because he knew what was going to happen. 
And there it is. Here's, here's, I have to call them out here. You, you remember how I said the other day, like people will offer these wild conspiracy theories and to, if, to validate them, all you need is to throw the Pachamama card down. And somehow that validates every wild and wacky thing that one just said prior to that. Um, here, here it is. This one says, nothing follow Jesus's commandments. Pachamama's first commandment, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. You break that one. The nine don't matter. There, there goes the Pacha. They throw that Pachamama card. They throw it down <laughs> whenever they're desperate and they don't have a comeback. They don't have a reasonable response. Whenever you show them this is unreasonable, it doesn't make sense. Here's why. Throw the Pachamama card down. It'll get you out of all illogical uh, difficulties. You just throw the Pachamama card down. Um, yeah, go and watch the video that Father Dagani and I did on Pachamama, and you'll you'll see the good, the bad, and the ugly, and you'll see it wasn't idolatry, and it wasn't even Pachamama in the ceremony itself. Um, so go and watch it. I'll put that in the show notes, but there, there you go. I mean, I, wasn't I just talking about that like two days ago? You throw the Pachamama car down, it ends like all discussion. They think that that somehow like solves everything, and it confirms all of the unreasonable and illogical and wild eyed conspiracy theories that they had just uttered through their mouth uh, prior to saying the words Pachamama and throwing the Pachamama card down. It's, it's, it's pretty comical at this point. It's so predictable too. All right, let's proceed. And what that says to us here sitting here today is that the resignation by Benedict itself was not particularly valid because he was under such pressure as we've discussed earlier, but also that because of the electioneering and everything, that the the election of Pope Francis, Jorge Bergoglio, was invalid. Like it never never had effect no matter what. Isn't it, this is profound? Well, I have a question for you, and you might know the answer to this. So again, here's the question. Let's see if he answers it directly. If Let's, for argument's sake, say that Pope Francis weren't properly elected or Benedict didn't properly resign. So all of that would mean the same thing. All of the sainthoods, all of the making of cardinals, all those things would what? Not exist now? Those, those cardinals are not cardinals? The most that I heard him directly answer that question in response was him saying, God will sort it all out, you know, that ad hoc argument, you know, whenever you're presented with a conundrum that you just cannot answer, God will figure it out. God will sort it all out. It's like, all right, we're, we're going there. Those saints are not saints? Or is there some provision of the church that takes care of that? Sure. So, you know, I think it's the Donatists, I always thought also the Jansenists that said the effect of the sacrament does not depend upon the holiness of the person celebrating the sacrament. However, that's that's entirely different. And this is a brilliant question, John Henry. That's entirely different from the fact that there must be a valid ordination, for instance, to to affect it. Uh, such that that's why when when some of these baptisms were invalid, it calls into question every sacrament made by or attempted by someone who was not properly baptized wherefore the ordination didn't count therefore the seeming sacraments he uh did don't don't count uh so if the pope bergoglio some people don't have maps like in such as in like in the iraq in like such as was not properly pope would those things with regard to uh, elevating people to cardinals, that's that's just a little whim and caprice on the part of him. Uh, I guess he could have his own little set of advisors all around him that wear the red hat, but they're imposters. They're posing as something that they are not because mm -hmm, Bergoglio wasn't mm -hmm, really. Mm -hmm. So the question was, what do you do if that's true? The Pope. Uh, because of because of these things instituted by John Paul II, because mm -hmm. he could see what was coming down the road. The sacraments, of course, that he would have celebrated, assuming his original ordination was valid would, would also still be valid. But, mm -hmm. um, but this is key when it comes to who's going to be then valid as a Cardinal to elect the next Pope at the next conclave. What an unbelievable situation. 
Just I I didn't hear an answer in there. All right, let's move on to this one. Let's see what uh, what we have in store. And Jorge Bergoglio. So there are two aspects of a pap papal's reign, and it's it's the same for a this is the same for a parish priest. You have your sacramental ministry, and then you got this administrative stuff you have to deal with every day, mm -hmm. like the roof is leaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, so when Benedict resigned, it is said by people who are way smarter than me on this issue that he only resigned that administrative part, but he kept, I don't know if it's called munis is the word, but he kept that, the sacramental aspect of it. So he didn't really fully and completely resign. And, and the beauty of that, the fact that he still lived for another decade or so, is that um, Jorge Bergoglio was kept in check because he knew full well that Pope Benedict could come out and say, just a second there, big guy, you have really strayed from the dogma of the church, from the deposit of faith. He was held in check by Benedict. Of that, I am certain. When, when? Like in those times that Benedict actually came out and said that he affirms the pontificate of Pope Francis and their two papacies are one? Like, what? When did this happen? Did I miss this? Did, did Benedict ever put Francis in check? What? And because uh, look how he's gone bananas uh, after Benedict dies, right? The whole crushing of the Latin mass, which he is not allowed to do. He does not have the authority to do so. And we don't have to follow him like some blind. Wait, hold on. Did I mishear him? Let me hear that again. Of that I am certain. And because uh, look how he's gone bananas uh, after Benedict dies, right? The whole crushing of the Latin mass, which he is not allowed to do. The crushing of the Latin Mass. I thought, what year was Christianus Custodis? It was like 20, 2021, July of 2021. That was before Benedict died. Let, let me hear that again. From the dogma of the church, from the deposit of faith. He was held in check by Benedict. Of that, I am certain. And because uh, look how he's gone bananas uh, after Benedict dies, right? The whole crushing of the Latin mass, which he is not allowed. So he crushed in his mind, he crushed the Latin mass after Benedict died. Except Traditionis Custodis was like a year and a half before Benedict died. Did Benedict put him in check? to do he does not have the authority to do so so he doesn't have the authority to restrict a particular missile well the entire manualist tradition would disagree with altman here trent the council of trent would disagree with altman vatican one would disagree with altman and there's also an appended anathema against those who deny what it says in the relevant portion there um he has the authority. It's a different question of whether he should have used that authority and whether it was a good idea. You know, those are different questions. But like, does he have the authority to restrict the missile of 62? Yeah. Yeah. He has that authority for better or worse. And believe it or not, you actually want the Pope to have that kind of authority. So it is for the better. That doesn't necessarily mean that in this particular case, that was the best judgment. But you do want to have a Pope who has that authority, which he does have that authority. Because if he doesn't, then ultimately the magisterium doesn't have authority over accidental matters of the liturgy, which is absurd because the entire history of uh, the liturgy shows otherwise, in addition to the magisterium arguing otherwise. And we don't have to follow him like some blind faith. Jorge Bergoglio lacks 100% authority, no authority at all, to stop the Latin Mass which is the dogma of the church. 
okay first of all uh i did do a video where does does pope francis have um can pope francis ban the latin mass i think is the title of it i'll put that in the show notes the latin mass is the dogma of the church it's it's a dogma y'all it's a dogma it's it's literally dogmatic so the latin mass existed in the first century it didn't it existed in the first century it's dogmatic i mean all dogma ex existed at the end of the first century because the deposit of faith ended with the end of the last apostle so at least by john's death you have the latin mass being dogmatically communicated to the churches mm -hmm. and y'all were making fun of me and y'all were saying, oh, Michael, you're just straw manning these people. Whenever I make uh, arguments against those who claim that the Latin Mass literally is a first century liturgy and literally came down from heaven, you know, in golden tablets, y'all were making fun of me and saying I was caricaturing people. Oh, really? Really? Huh. Let's hear that again. 100% authority no authority at all to stop the latin mass which is the dogma of the church he has no right and i'm the one straw manning people and i'm the one making up a caricature really you still believe that you have no idea how many people say oh michael you're just making it all up there's nobody out there that believes that you underestimate people <laughs> Or you overestimate them, I should say. <laughs> Maybe this time you should estimate them, as they say in the office. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Look, there are people who believe the KJV goes back to Paul. That's not a caricature. There are people who really do believe that, that Jesus and Paul actually spoke Elizabethan English. Yes. Jesus said, thee and thou, not you. Jesus said, thou. I've heard those words. I've heard those words directly from the lips of an individual. People do believe that. And it's not a caricature to say that there are people who do believe that the Latin mass itself goes back to the first century. I told you, I, I told you I wasn't making it up. It's dogmatic, y'all. It's dogma. Well, I look, I concede that if if somehow the Latin mass, you know, which he's again referring to the missile of 62, because uh, the Missile 69, the Novus Ordo, could be celebrated in Latin, but he's referring to the um, uh, the Missile of 62 here, the Tridentine Mass after a whole bunch of developments from the time of the Council of Trent until 1962. Um, but yeah, I, I grant, like, if, if somehow the Missile of 62 was dogmatic in nature, you know, Jesus, Jesus gave us in the first century the 1962 Missile, even though it's the 1962 missile. If somehow that were true, yeah, I agree that it would be dogmatic in that case, and Pope Francis wouldn't be able to like restrict that. Like, I totally agree. I totally agree. But that's what I'm challenging: the claim that somehow the peculiarities to the missile 62, the accidental features that distinguish the missile 62 from the missile 69 that somehow those are apostolic in nature um and and not only apostolic but divine apostolic so we're not just talking about human apostolic tradition we're talking about divine apostolic tradition i.e dogma it's dogmatic y'all you heard it here first i to do so and no catholic no priest no bishop and no cardinal has to follow that he has no right to do so and he isn't man enough to stand up and admit it. And he's going to burn in hell because of, for a thousand different reasons, Jorge Bergoglio. So Pope Francis is going to burn in hell. Did I hear that correctly? Let's hear it again. He has no right to do so. And he isn't man enough to stand up and admit it. Mm -hmm. And he's going to burn in hell because of, for a thousand different reasons, Jorge Bergoglio. Mm -hmm. um, but so anyway, so but. So anyways, we're just going to move on from that point. Um, <laughs> so Pope Francis is an antichrist who is going against dogma by restricting the Missile of 62. And he's a viper 
and he's prancing about in a white cassock and he's gonna burn in hell gosh tell us how you really feel about him let me hear that one more time i let's go back you know, here. what i get let me go back to that one more time. I think it was like the one minute 46 timestamp, somewhere around there. Let's hear it one more time. And Jorge Bergoglio. So there are, and, uh, and where it comes more recently is with regard to Benedict and Jorge Bergoglio. So there are two aspects of a pap papal's reign, and it's like a roof is leaking, right? Uh, so when Benedict resigned, it is said by people who are way smarter than me on this issue that he only resigned that administrative part, but he kept the aspect of it. So he didn't really fully and completely resign. And, and the beauty of that, the fact that he still lived for another decade or so, is that um, Jorge Bergoglio was kept in check. Because he knew full well that Pope Benedict could come out and say, just a second there, big guy. You have really strayed from the dog. And Benedict totally did that when Traditionis came out. He totally put Francis in check. He was like, just a second, big guy. You can't. Benedict totally did that. Don't you remember when Benedict did that? He totally did that of the church from the deposit of faith he was held in check by benedict of that i am certain and uh because look how he's gone bananas uh after benedict dies speaking of going bananas right the whole crushing of the latin mass which he is not allowed to do he does not have the authority to do so and we don't have to follow him like some blind faith jorge Bergoglio lacks 100 percent authority no authority at all to Stop the Latin Mass, which is the dogma of the church. He has no right to do so, and no Catholic, no priest, no bishop, and no cardinal has to follow that. He has no right to do so, and he isn't man enough to stand up and admit it. And he's going to burn in hell because of for a thousand different reasons, Jorge Bergoglio. Um, but so do for a thousand different man enough to stand up and admit it. And he's going to burn in hell because of her. And he isn't man enough to stand up and admit it. And he's going to burn in hell because of her. And he isn't man enough to stand up and admit it. And he's going to burn in hell because of her. A thousand different reasons. Not to stand up and admit it. And he's going to burn in hell because of her. And he I'm sorry. I'm just, I, I'm making sure that I understood him correctly. That's why I'm playing it back here. He isn't man enough to stand up and admit it. And he's going to burn in hell because of for a thousand different reasons to stand up and admit it. And he's going to burn in hell because of for a thousand different reasons, Jorge Bergoglio. Um, there you go. I mean, you, you heard it from Father Roman. Evidently, Pope Francis is going to burn in hell forever for a thousand different reasons. Hmm. But so anyway, so but even if there's some question about uh, Benedict and Bergoglio, who was who, what powers did each of them have? That certainly ended. And, and it was um, Altman who was canceled, right? So he was canceled. He was being persecuted. Do you think that maybe things like these were things that his bishop was aware of? behind closed doors and maybe he took those things into account. I'm not saying he did. I'm not saying that Altman's bishop knew things like this about Altman and took them into account, but maybe he knew them. Maybe he, I'm, I'm not saying he did, but maybe he knew them. Maybe he accounted for them. Maybe stuff like this went into his decision to cancel Father Rowan. Maybe. I'm not saying it's factual. I don't know that. I'm just saying maybe. In the same way that they say, well, maybe Pope Francis is in a pop. Maybe it was an invalid. Okay, I get to play the maybe game too. Maybe his bishop knew some of these things about Altman and kind of knew that he was harboring some of these views. And maybe it was considered whenever 
he chose to go the direction he went with him. Maybe. Maybe not. But maybe. Upon Just throwing that out there. Benedict. And so now the question is, well, does Jorge Bergoglio have any authority as Pope at all now at this point? It's all a very confusing thing. And it shouldn't be confusing. There should never, this problem should never have arisen in the Catholic Church to begin with. Any confusion. Confusion is not from heaven. Confusion is from hell. Hell or heaven. Remember, amen. God wanted to create. Amen. Thank you so much, Father. I'll confusion is from hell. It's from the demon of confusion. Yes. Everybody who is out there confusing minds about whether or not Pope Francis is actually Pope, I I second that. That is from hell. I agree. That couldn't have been said any better, Father Alma. Thank you so much. You are correct about that. Confusion is from hell. It is demonic. It is evil. And those who are out there confusing people in these areas, well, you know where it's coming from. You heard it from Father Alma. I mean, he's, he said it. So, Order out of chaos. That's right from Genesis chapter 1 and 2, right? God creates order. He cleans up what is a mess. It makes it nice and neat and tidy. He creates order. What did Jorge Bergoglio say when he first <clears throat> assumed whatever authority he had? He said, I'm, I'm going to make a mess of things. <laughs> Sorry, Jorge. That is. Yeah, that's exactly what he said. And he totally said it in that context, too. Those were the exact. That's like a direct quote of Pope Francis. And that's the exact sense in which he meant it, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Father Arlen not the job description of the Catholic Pope. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, so is it empty now? Well, I've never said so. He hasn't said so. He hasn't said so. He hasn't said so. Okay. I have never asserted that uh, ever in anything I said. I said he's a fraud of a Catholic. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. There was all that other stuff that we just heard, by the way, but sure. Um, and by the way, this was two months ago. So that the previous video that we watched was before all this. So all of those things about, well, it wasn't fully a valid uh, resignation and therefore wouldn't, he wouldn't be validly elected and all. But he never said Pope Francis isn't the Pope. He never said that. But he did say all that other stuff. Um, but he never said it. This reminds me of another Father James, Father James Martin. He never says that homosexual uh, homosexual acts are intrinsically good. He doesn't say that. But one could certainly get that impression from him. But he doesn't say it. It's the exact same stuff. But whether he was validly or elected or not, because there's some there's some argument about that document that uh, Pope St. John Paul II put together mm -hmm. that said if you do something, you are automatically excommunicated because you've been... Yeah, and, and that totally impacts the validity of the election because... Excommunicated cardinals can't validly elect a pope, according to Father Altman, even though, again, um, that's incorrect. They can illicitly, yet validly, still elect, again, for better or worse. I kind of think for better, for the exact same reason why um, I think it's for better that a bishop doesn't automatically lose his office uh, when he internalizes... Um, you know, sin or heresy or something like that. Um, because then you could just never know that your bishop actually exercises valid jurisdiction and that your sins are actually absolved because that's tied into his jurisdiction. And so like you would become basically a Donatist at that point. Um, so I'm actually kind of glad that excommunicated cardinals can still validly yet illicitly elect a Pope, but, Oh, oh okay. I guess, I guess he settled it for us here been doing all this electioneering and all this sort of stuff beforehand and and indeed they were McCarrick did too um, the um, 
I, I, I'm not even going to offer an opinion because I I'm not an expert in this. He uh, he's not even going to offer because he totally didn't offer any kind of opinion just now about Pope Francis, like the whole bit about him going to hell, and then again the previous video that we saw too much prior to he gave no opinions about Pope Francis's validity, just like none. He didn't give any, and so he's not going to give any opinions here because I mean. He's not going to get an opinion, right? So, there are some people who say he's not really the Pope. I don't know. He walks around. Some people say, I mean, there's some people who say that, you know, maybe, maybe Father Altman's bishop knew all these things about him prior to relieving him as pastor. And took that into account when relieving him as pastor and didn't cancel him. But maybe he was aware. Some people say those things, okay? Some people say those things. I'm not saying they're true, but some people say that. Brown and the white cassock. I don't care whether he is a pope or not. I don't care if you are the pope. You do not have authority to change Catholic dogma. And Pope Francis has totally been changing Catholic dogma. He does that every single day with every single encyclical that he's issued, every apostolic. Exam. He just changed the dogma. Now, again, I know that there's plenty of rats who argue that. I've looked at every one of the instances that they've mentioned, and that's not the, not the case. It's usually from people who don't know how the magisterium works who make those arguments. Usually from people who can't even define properly what a dogma is. Uh, those are usually the people who make those claims. But yeah, I mean, I agree with Father Allman. He he can't change dogma. I mean that that is true. Pope Francis cannot change dogma. And for any Catholic who's naive enough to think that somehow the Church can change these dogmas, and yeah, just stop it. Because there are some naive Catholics out there that think, well, if the if the Pope just says, or if the bishops just get together in a synod and say that somehow homosexual acts are okay now, that means it's cool, right? If you can just get them on board to say that somehow, that means it's true. No, no. The magisterium cannot change dogma. That That is fundamental. And the reason why is dogma is intimately based on divine revelation. Well, divine revelation, something that's revealed by God, has to be true. It cannot be false. Otherwise, God would be a liar. So divine revelation itself is immutable. It cannot change. The truth of it, it cannot change. So the magisterium has no ability to come back and say, well, what God actually revealed is no longer true. and for those who say, well, maybe that's true, but maybe this issue about homosexual acts is, isn't dogmatic. It, 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 yeah, it's dogmatic. It's right there in Sacred Scripture, which is divine revelation. So, yeah, that can't be changed. So, in principle, I agree with Father Elman. He cannot change dogma. Even Vatican II, De Verbum, is very clear about that. The magisterium serves the deposit of faith. It's not over it. It's not above it. It cannot change it. It cannot alter it. It cannot delete from it, add to it, corrupt it. None of that. It cannot do that. It has zero authority to do that. So in principle, I agree. But I would just say that, yeah, well, Pope Francis hasn't changed the dogma. But if you define dogma as the Missile of 62, and you start talking about Pope Francis restricting the Missile of 62, okay, yeah, in his mind, Pope Francis has changed dogma, even though it's still available, but I guess a restriction is somehow a, a denial of it. Yeah, that's if somehow the Missile of 62 were dogmatic, but... Are we really arguing that the missile of 62 is a first century missile? Is that really what we're going to argue at this point? Should should I break it to him? Should I, should should we tell him? Should we tell him there was no Roman canon for the several centuries in the early church? There was no Roman canon. There was no unified Roman canon. It didn't exist. Bishops were extemporaneously coming up with canons. Should should we cue them in on that? I mean, and, and it's not just the canon, by the way, but a bunch of other things. But evidently, the Missile of 62 is dogmatic. It's first century. It, period. And if you do, you have, okay, all right, okay, here you go. You asked. Don't take my word for it. Uh, here it is, the question. 
and, and I've been sending this out in, in my Lenten letters. And this is by uh, from St. Robert Cardinal Bellarmine. So Cardinal Robert Bellarmine, SJ. Mm-hmm. He was a Jesuit back when the Jesuits were Catholic. Mm-hmm. They're, they're not now. Father Brown, did you hear that? You're not a Catholic, Father Brown. <laughs> Hope, hope you heard that one. You're, you're, you've been excommunicated from your own communion now. I mean, sorry, Father Brown. I mean, you're the one not exercising legitimate ministry in the church now, evidently. Understand this. There's still a handful. There always will be a remnant who are genuinely Catholic. Well, that sounds familiar. There's always going to be that remnant, that remnant theology. Yeah, I mean, we're... Where else have I heard that from? Oh, I know Protestantism. Yeah, mm-hmm. the Jesuits are not Catholic. They don't. They don't teach the truth of the Catholic Church. When you allow James Martin to run around the world teaching what James Martin teaches with the full approval of the Jesuit order, they have lost. They have gone into apostasy. There's no doubt that there's certain Jesuits that are incredibly problematic. I'm right there with them. Um. But what I hear from Father Altman is the exact same problems as Father Martin, not in the exact same issue, but the exact same ambiguities, the exact same dissent from the magisterium. It's the exact same stuff. It's just a different topic. It's two sides to the same dissenting coin. One is conservative, one is progressive, but it is literally the exact same thing. But evidently every Jesuit now is not kind of but back when they were Catholic as a whole, the Jesuit, or by the way, the, the, the priests that formed me most closely, most profoundly, most spiritually, most faithfully were Jesuits. Well, he threw them a bone. So in fairness to Father Altman, he did throw them a bone. Maybe he'd fall, Father Brown, maybe he'd throw you a bone too. But they were persecuted by the Jesuit brothers because they were truly faithful Catholics, right? So, all right, so here's St. Robert Cardinal Bellarmine, S.J., Bishop, Dr. Of the church. Mm-hmm. So not just your ordinary run of the mill saints. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's I'm I'm really eager to hear what he has to say here, but I'll note that he's pointing us to a doctor of the church in a non-magisterial capacity, which again means it has absolutely zero authority to bind your conscience. Um <laughs> over and against what I'm going to assume are going to be over and against magisterial sources, like actual magisterial sources that one could point to. We're going to discard those and we're going to go to a non-authoritative writing that cannot bind your conscience over and against authoritative writings that actually do bind your conscience as a Catholic, uh, at least for those who actually are Catholics and are following the magisterium. But let's hear it. Let's hear it out. <laughs> Not just your run of cardinal. He's a doctor of the church. And I think there's 35 in 2,000 years. Only 35. This is one of them. And this is what he said. He said, the question was whether a heretical pope can be deposed. Mm -hmm. And this is what he said. Mm -hmm. The same Bellarmine who did not believe that a pope could or has ever taught heresy, by the way. He not only didn't believe that any pope has ever taught heresy, including Honorius, he also believed no pope could. So that's the Bellarmine we're talking about here. Okay, let's proceed. A pope who is a manifest heretic. Notice the words manifest. Think. Think Pachamama. Nope. 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 Epic fail. Go and watch the Pachamama video. Not even in the same category. If that were anything, it would be idolatry, not heresy. Those are not the same thing, um, but it's actually neither. If you go and back and watch the video, but there you go. I mean, look, look, whatever unreasonable argument you just throw the Pachamama card down, it settles everything. It ratifies everything that you say. You throw the Pachamama down. Um, notice though, he's talking about manifest heresy. How does Bellarmine define manifest heresy? How does Bellarmine define manifest heresy? Bellarmine defines manifest heresy as somebody who has been warned canonically by the by the appropriate authorities twice, two times per the uh, instructions of Paul, who says to warn the heretic twice and then have nothing to do with him. That is a manifest heretic. Has Pope Francis been warned 
and rebuked twice by the appropriate people who are the appropriate people. Some are going to argue the College of Cardinals and others are going to argue an imperfect ecumenical council, which neither one has happened. Has he been rebuked twice for heresy and persisted in heresy? No. So according to Bellarmine's definition of manifest heresy, he has not yet actually met that definition of manifest heresy. But of course, Altman is not going to explain any of that to you. He's literally just going to assume his definition of heresy, which means Pachamama, which again, wasn't even Pachamama in the garden ceremony, and it wasn't even idolaters. I certainly agree that it gives an appearance of scandal, and it is a really poor depiction of the Virgin Mary. Uh, but again, go and watch the video I did with Father Jagani, and you'll see that. You'll see the entire context behind it. So that one has ran out of gas. Obviously, he hasn't received the memo. But even, again, if it were somehow idolatry, that's still not a manifest heretic. But, all right, let's continue. Maybe he'll add something else here. Think, think McCarrick. Think breeding like rabbits. Think beach ball on the altar. Think Jesus is a communist. So, <laughs> hold on, wait. <laughs> so when a beach ball flew up on the altar it, it pope francis picked it up and threw it off the altar because to my recollection that's what happened accidentally a beach ball came up on the altar and he removed it from the altar if i recall correctly let's say he didn't though like let's say he just left it there you're a manifest heretic if you have a beach ball on the altar <laughs> Well, look, I mean, it's pretty ridiculous if you have a beach ball on the altar. I, I think that that's, you know, certainly uh, toying with sacrilege at that point, right? It's, it, it, at least if it's intentional, right? Um, you intend to have, like, a beach ball on the altar. Like, what are you thinking? This is the sacrifice of Christ. Like, what, what's going on here? That's incredibly inappropriate. Um, how, how does that translate into heresy, let alone manifest heresy? As Beller means dividing it. I don't know, but evidently it's supposed to work because what happens is if you throw the Pachamama card, everything that you say that is unreasonable and illogical is somehow true now because you threw down the Pachamama card. It's just think beach balls, the beach balls of the altar. It just, there we go. What was the other one? What was the other one? Let, let me hear it again. Hold on. Think Pachamama. Think. Think McCarrick. McCarrick. So tolerating, I mean, because at, at the most, what he did is he tolerated uh, somebody who he shouldn't have tolerated. Somehow means you're a manifest heretic. Gosh, wouldn't that make almost every pope in history a manifest heretic? Like, <laughs> God, how many of the preconciliar popes would have been knocked off for that one? I mean. Gosh, they tolerated some really bad stuff in some instances. Um, wow. That's heresy, evidently. Okay. Think breeding like rabbits. Think His breeding like rabbits comment was heresy and manifest heresy. <laughs> I'm getting the impression Father Altman doesn't know what heresy is, let alone manifest heresy. What heresy means to Father Altman, evidently, if I were to take like the common denominator from beach balls to Pachamama to um, breeding like rabbits, is you said something that I disagree with and I think is wrong. That is Father Altman's seemingly his definition of heresy. So when, when he says the word heresy, it's not, well, you're post baptism contradicting a dogma no that's not heresy in his mind heresy is you said something that i think is wrong and i don't agree with it and i think it's not traditional in 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 the most ambiguous sense of what tradition means think beach ball on the altar think jesus is a communist a pope who is a manifest heretic and bergoglio is a manifest heretic ceases in himself to be pope and head so that's that's a doctor of the church saying this and because he's a doctor of the church is definitive like that is authoritative and cajetan and suarez and others who argue different they're not as authoritative because 
they're not dog doctors of the church. And therefore you have to believe Bellarmine's understanding and Bellarmine's understanding is certainly applicable here to Pope Francis because he's been canonically warned twice. That has happened, which obviously it hasn't happened. None of this has actually happened, even according to Bellarmine's theory. Um, and that's all it is, is a theory. You're free to dismiss it. Him being a doctor of the church means zero in this instance of binding your conscience. You're free to disagree with him on theological grounds. Um, you know who else is a doctor of the church? Gregory of Narc, who wasn't even a formal Catholic. He was an Armenian. An Armenian Christian. Wasn't even formally a Catholic, and he's a doctor of the church. So I accept him as a doctor of the church. But what I'm saying is just because he's a doctor of the church somehow means everything he says is authoritative. You, you really want to carry that to its logical conclusion? You, you, you really want to carry that to its logical conclusion? I would just tease that one out. Well, anyways. This is what they do, though, by the way. They, they will quote over and over some brief quotes. And they're they're getting it usually from the set of Acontis who have been doing this for decades now. They'll quote some brief quotes um, from Bellarmine and then exclude other parts. And they'll especially quote the manifest heretic part, but they won't tell you how Bellarmine defines it. Um, and they also won't define heresy. And then they won't see is any of that applicable to anything Pope Francis has done. They'll just assume you know what all it means. And then they will capitalize on things that you don't like about Pope Francis, like beach balls and punch mama and this and that. And, and as soon as you throw those down, it's like you had me a punch mama and they're just expecting you to go along with it because you threw the punch mama card down and you threw the beach ball card down. Cardinal <clears throat> Bellin, Robert Bellin ceases in himself to be a Pope and head just as he ceases in himself to be a Christian and a member of the body of the church. You see, he is he is schismed. I said this before. Jorge Bergoglio has schismed away from the church. A high-ranking prelate said this to me years ago. But yeah, this is a curious one. Like, can the Pope go into schism? I know that there were some who argued it. I'm pretty sure it was Suarez. But when I look at their arguments, they're deplorable. I mean, with all due respect, with all due respect, they're deplorable. And it's also because they're using a different definition of schism than we're using today. That's that's partly why some of these theologians who have absolutely zero authority over your conscience, um, they would argue the Pope could actually be in schism because they're actually defining schism differently than how we define it today. And also the arguments that they're even using are pretty epically terrible, in my opinion. And I'd be happy to uh, maybe do a stream on that and, you know, show why these are just not good arguments. But moreover, again, they're using a different definition of schism than we use today. In the way that we use schism today, it's impossible for a pope to be in schism because schism is the definition, is defined as a lack of submission to the Roman pontiff and those who are in communion with him. Um, like, by definition, the pope can't be in schism, according to that definition. By definition. <laughs> so... <laughs> Let's let's continue. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> there is a de facto schism in the church, but nobody will talk about it. Not what I do. I don't oh, I talk about it all the time. I talk about a de facto schism constantly, but not necessarily with the group that he says is in schism. I tend to identify a different group as in schism. Because I'm operating with Canon 751 in mind and its definition of schism, not this fanciful made up version of what schism means. I don't care. Uh, Nelson tries to say that I'm on the wrong side of that line. Oh, no, I'm not. Because I have 2,000 years of saints and martyrs. That's all I'm. There you go. I mean, just say that you're on the side of the saints and martyrs and that settles it. I mean, like Luther totally never did that. He never did that. He never said that he was on the side of the saints. Like Luther never, mm -mm. you know, there's no heretic out there has ever claimed to have been on the side of the martyrs and saints. They just, they didn't exist. Following, right? 
These these modernist schismatics are the ones who have schismed away from the church, and Jorge Bergoglio is one of them. So it says. Uh, there, there goes the, another one of those words. I mean, you throw the modernist car down, boom, settles everything. Even though these guys generally cannot define for you what modernism actually is, which is what I find to be curious. They couldn't tell you a thing about Pashendi, the Lamentavali, or Pius X and his actual use of the term modernism. Couldn't tell you a thing about it. They couldn't tell you anything historically about the heresy of modernism. But they're very confident in the way that they use the term. And the way they use the term is, again, not the historic definition, but more, you said something I don't like and I disagree with and I think is not traditional. That's their definition of what modernism is. You'll notice it's it's the exact same definition that they use for heresy and schism as well. Those are an apostasy. Like those terms all mean the exact same thing in their mind. Apostasy, schism, heresy, modernism. They all mean the exact same thing. There's no difference in their mind. It just all means you said something I don't agree with and I think is wrong and I believe is not traditional. Uh, Cardinal Bellarmine, doctor of the church, said a pope who is manifest heretic ceases in himself to be pope and head just as he ceases in himself to be a Christian and a member of the body of the church, whereby he can be judged and punished by the church. And, and again, Bellarmine said and thought and believed that no pope could ever be a heretic. Do you agree with that too, Father Alman? But wait, he's a doctor of the church, right? He's a cardinal. He's a doctor of the church. He's a, There's only like 35 of these guys, right? That's his number, by the way, not mine. Um, there's only 35 of these guys. He's a cardinal and he's a doctor of the church. And he honestly believed and asserted and wrote that a pope couldn't be a heretic. So I guess Father Allman doesn't believe that a pope could be a heretic because, I mean, again, if you throw the Bellarmine card down. Okay. Anybody at, well, so the problem is, is a lot of Regoglio's cronies, like McCarrick, right? Like uh, Daniil's there in Belgium, who's dead now. Like some of these other ones, I think Montini was one of them. He was a cardinal up in, I think, maybe Milan. Uh, anyway, whereby he can be judged and punished by the church, but they won't do it because they're all his cronies. This is, in, and then, but Bellerman goes on to say, this isn't just Robert Bellerman, cardinal and doctor of the church. This isn't just his opinion. He says, this is the opinion of all the ancient, all the ancient fathers mm -hmm. of the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was his opinion of the fathers of the church. Yes, we're well aware that that it was Bellarmine's opinion of what the fathers of the church taught. Right. What else did Bellarmine say? That was part of the fathers of the church. What, what else did he say? And are you consistent with those things? And if not, why? Who teach that manifest heretics immediately lose all jurisdiction. Right. So the minute. He brings the Pachamama into St. Peter's. You're out of there. Or he'd be you're out. You're done. Like, as soon as you bring the pot, you're done. That's it. It's settled. Goglio, we don't have to listen to you anymore. Until you publicly repent, or he Goglio, you have no authority. You are schismatic. You are an apostate. People don't like to hear that. It doesn't mean the seat's empty. Oh, there's somebody sitting there who just happens to be an apostate. Right? Aren't these the same guys who say that those who are outside the church can't rule those in the church? And they'll proof text Leo the 13th. Like, wait, what? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, wait. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me get this straight. I'm going to listen to it again, but I just want to get this straight. So an apostate, like somebody who has totally repudiated the Christian faith and an idolater, um, and is not a member of the church and is a heretic. Um, again, he's not in any way Catholic. He's not a Catholic. He's an apostate. He's a heretic. He's a modernist. He's an idolater. He's an antichrist. Did I miss anything else? He's going to hell. Um, I think I got them all. He's prancing about with the white garment. Uh, he still is on the Sea of St. Peter. 
<laughs> All right. Okay. Sea of St. Peter is still intact, though. Like, it's still Gucci. Like, nothing wrong with that. Sea of St. Peter is still good. It's still unblemished. It's the unblemished Sea of St. Peter. It's good to go, right? It's... <laughs> Let me hear that again. Hold on. Authority. You are schismatic. You are an apostate. I, people don't like to hear that. It doesn't mean the seat's empty. Oh, there's somebody sitting there. It just happens to be an apostate. So it's not empty. It, somehow, even though we just heard all this stuff about an invalid election and everything, it's still somehow occupied. I, I don't know how. Uh, but it's still somehow occupied, even though it was invalid. It's still not empty. Somebody's sitting on it, but they're an apostate, non-Christian, non-believer who's governing the church. But your Sea of St. Peter is still good to go. It's still like... The, the Eastern Orthodox are going to have a field day with Father Holman. <laughs> They're going to have a field day with his ecclesiology. Like he's he's just, he's ripe for the picking for the Eastern Orthodox. <laughs> Is it, isn't this exactly what the Orthodox have been saying all along? Yeah, of course, the Sea of St. Peter. It's, yeah, of course. Of course, it's it's you know unblemished. Of course, we're in communion with the CSA Peter, just not the guy who's currently sitting in the CSA Peter. Like, he's a heretic. <laughs> the Orthodox have been saying this for a very long time. Like what I the ecclesiology I just heard was Eastern Orthodox par excellence. <laughs> right. He says, name, and he's talking about St. Cyprian, uh, and then it goes on, he says, let's see, even, he said, he means that Novation, who was, I think, Pope at one time, even if he was a true and legitimate Pope, right, so this this answers your question instead of a contest, whether Bergoglio was legitimately elected, <coughs> Bellman says that even if Novation was legitimate <coughs> and true Pope, still would have fallen from the pontificate by himself if he separated himself from the church. The same is the opinion of the learned men of our age. As John Drado teaches, those who are cast out as excommunicants or leave on their own and oppose the church are separated from it, namely heretics and schismatics. So there you have it. It's not, I don't care whether the seat's empty or not. That's that issue doesn't, I'm not even concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is the apostasy. It's not even an the, issue. The person like, who prances, it's not even an issue if the Sea of St. Peter is empty or not. Like, that is not even a factor for Father Old. Doesn't matter, it's empty or not, doesn't really matter. That whole Vatican one thing of perpetual success. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. Doesn't matter. I don't really care about that question. I don't care whether the seat's empty or not. That's that issue doesn't. I'm not even concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is the apostasy of the the person who prances around in the white cassock mm -hmm. and his buddies who are equally apostate that run around doing what they do. Mm -hmm. So um, th I hope that answers the question. Uh, set of a contest means the seat's empty. I'm not. I've never said the seat was empty. Just saying the person who occupies it is a schismatic apostate. <laughs> I didn't say it. I just said all this other stuff. But I didn't say it. It's Father James Martin. <laughs> I didn't say homosexual acts are intrinsically ordered and good. I just said all this other stuff. But I didn't say that the church is teachings are wrong i didn't say that i just said all this other stuff <laughs> um let me go back to what father altman said yeah confusion is a really bad thing confusion comes from hell yeah confusion is a really bad thing and i'm picking up on a great deal of confusion here on father altman's part he seems very confused because he is in, in the bishops that won't support that are a bunch of cowards themselves. 
And here's how you know, right? It, it, it's just so easy. This isn't my opinion. There are about 290 active bishops in the United States, roughly, give or take. And, and remember when Corday Leon finally, after 10 years, mm-hmm. finally came out and said, Nancy Pelosi shall not receive Holy Communion and commit sacrilege in my diocese. And there were 17 other bishops that supported him. So a total of 18 out of that 290. That means 272, roughly, did not support him. And in fact, some came out and publicly said, like Wilton Gregory, you know who he is. Uh, well, there's one for you. Uh, said, oh, no, they can receive it. And then and then Nancy Pelosi jets over to Rome, receives Holy Communion at the Vatican. Right? That, that's of almost 95, 96% of the bishops of this country failed to stand up for the truth of the Holy Eucharist and the sacrilege thou shalt not commit. I think that he has a point here. As far as some people who needed to say something didn't, and then Pope Francis certainly failed, in my opinion, on this issue. I've said that before, and I'll say it again. Pope Francis failed, and I think he implicitly undermined um, Cordelione on this issue, and in, uh, in the response that he gave uh, when he was asked about it. I, th- I think there's some legitimate criticism of Pope Francis and bishops who haven't spoken up on this issue. I think there's some legitimate grievances here. That's why I say this group, not all their, of their grievances are legitimate. In fact, the majority of their grievances are not legitimate. They're pharisaical or they're based on errors in theology. Uh, but no, there are some points here and there where they say something that it's like, yeah, you're right. That's a legitimate criticism. They tend to go too far with it, drawing the wrong conclusions with it oftentimes, but Occasionally, you'll hear some things that are just like, yeah, you have a point. And this is one of those that's like, yeah, this is a failure. And um, this is why I think that there are some things that you could legitimately criticize about this pontificate. But again, be consistent, because I think you could say the same thing about some of the other pontificates as well, not only in the post-conciliar period, but also pre-conciliar period. Right. There was soupage down in Chicago, right? Remember when... Cardinal George died. He let Rahm Emanuel, the Jewish mayor of New York, I think he's Jewish, receive Holy Communion. Not a Catholic. Catholics don't have a right to receive Holy Communion. You have to be in a state of grace. And you have to, be, first of all, you have to be. I think I think he meant like non-Catholics don't have a right uh, to receive Holy Communion. I think he just misspoke there. Catholic. And then you have to be Catholic in a state of grace. So he let Rahm Emanuel receive Holy Communion. Didn't say boo about it. And then next thing you know, here is uh, Lori Lightfoot. I think she's a Methodist. I don't know this situation particularly, so he might be right. He might be wrong. She supports abortion. She claims to be married to her female lover. And, and she prances up and receives Holy Communion. And Rigo, or Supis doesn't say anything about it. He's also the where that priest has some soap bubbles in the sanctuary and singing Cool in the Gang in the church and the mass. Again, all this may or may not be true. I don't know. I, I'd have to fact check him. May or may not be true. How did we get on to Supic, though? Um, I thought we were talking about set of a contism, Pope Francis, but okay. Um, I think you get the point. We got uh, we got our Father Altman perspective here on uh, Pope Francis. I think what, we're at an hour and a half, so you got a pretty heavy dose there of uh, his thoughts about Pope Francis. I mean, that's what I titled this, Father James Altman's view of Pope Francis. I'm not entirely sure it's a coherent view. I'm not entirely sure it's a consistent view. It does not appear to be entirely accurate and based in reality. But if you just sprinkle a little bit of Pachamama on it, it somehow seems to work, I guess. Anyways, I hope you all enjoy this. If so, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Share this on your social media with people who need to be aware of this stuff. People need to be aware. Share it with them. And if you want to support what I'm doing, check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. See you later. Are you confused about how Catholic teaching authority works with encyclicals, papal bulls, councils, and many other things? It's easy to get confused on what is authoritative and what is not. Fortunately, at MaximusInstitute.com, I have prepared a course explaining the magisterium from A to Z. Visit the website and check out the course Understanding the Magisterium for more information.
Hey everybody, just wanted to tell you about my new free ebook, Church Chaos, Biblical Insights for Confused Catholics. If you are a confused Catholic and you're thinking about leaving the Catholic Church or you're thinking about converting to the Church but you see that there's a crisis in the Church and you're just unsure, this is the book for you. Again, it is free. Just simply go to reasonandtheology.com. You'll see a pop-up that comes up on your screen. Just simply click on it and you'll put in your email and it will provide you the free PDF ebook right then and there. Please check it out if you're confused about the situation in the Catholic Church today. Reasonandtheology.com. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button. See you next time. God bless.